and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Um, this is called Inquisition Update meets Hour of the Truth because I am again here with my brother in Christ Tom Press from Inquisition Update for the tenth part already of the reading and discussion of the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. And as always, uh, with the last nine recordings on this tense one also, Tom Press is accompanying me in the United States of America over there. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing fine, and I'm happy to be here. It's a blessing, and uh, looking forward to the study today. I absolutely see it the same way. It is a blessing to have you here, and it's a blessing to do this on this wonderful day, because something that I haven't told you yet uh, in our little pre-conversation we had before this recording here, uh, today my son came to visit me, and uh, we had a very intense and wonderful conversation about how spirits are leading us in our life. Of course, I was leading that conversation because my son is not yet... Um, that far in his development let's say but coming to the same direction and we established uh, that at least the same spirit is leading us we are both meek truth seeking gentle kind and we always have problems with the society that we live in today because the society is just the other way around yeah and the more my son experiences that and the more I tell him why that is that way, the more he understands what I'm trying to bring to him. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to bring him to Christ because I told him I can't do that. God chooses his yeah. people. But as it was with me a few years ago when I had this conversation with a friend of mine that set a spark to get me interested in researching the New World Order and all that stuff, which eventually led me to Christ, I thought... No, that was Christ all the way leading me to him. That's right. And I just told my son, well, I'm just trying to set that spark in your life. Yeah. Because I hope that God would choose you too. Mm -hmm. So we had a really fine and wonderful conversation. But um, now let's go back to the book reading here. I'm very happy for that. The Holy Spirit led me in that, and uh, the Holy Spirit leads us in the reading and discussion of the origin of Futurism and Preterism, part two, uh, which we have started a few broadcasts ago. Uh, the second part of the book, that is the tragic aftermath of Futurism, the part of the book that is written by Charles Jennings. And I will continue, for continuation's sake, on page 50 and read to you the last paragraph there that is titled False Hope. Throughout the development of the futurist interpretation of prophecy, the advocates of this false theory have capitalized on certain future events, which they feel are extremely critical. These future events include the mark of the beast, a one-world government and church, which they are ignorantly helping to create the establishment of the Zionist state of Israel as being the fulfillment of Bible prophecy the present-day Jewish people as being the totality of all 12 tribes of Israel, a seven-year tribulation period, and their highly prized lucrative doctrine, the secret rapture of the Church. In their fervor to promote this theory, which many truly born-again saints sincerely believe, yet never researched, they have used many Bible passages as part of their support system. The following are just a few. And we start with quoting from Revelation 4, verse 1. Quote, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Uncaught. Which must be hereafter. Well, I do not go into much commenting of the very first paragraph, because we did that already in the last uh, session that we set here together. But I think that we have to understand this very important word, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So the author continues reading, and the experience that John the Revelator records here has been mistakenly used to teach the timing of the rapture as being just before the beginning of the Quote unquote, tribulation. This call, uh, this call to John to quote unquote, come up hither 
is supposedly, supposedly the call for all the saints to rise up to their eternal home. When honestly reading this text, there is no indication whatsoever that there is any rapture at all taking place. This call to John applied only to him to rise in spiritual ecstasy in order to receive revelations about coming events. Now about coming events, this of course is absolutely against the teaching of the uh, preterist agenda. Because if it all happened already before 70 AD, when John wrote the book of Revelation in 95 AD on the island Patmos, Jesus Christ actually would be lying when he said, I will show thee things which must be hereafter, because then they would have been done already in the past. Now the Paul, Apost the Paul the Apostle records in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 2 through 4 that he, quote, knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, how that he was caught up into paradise, unquote. This was a very similar experience like John, yet the rapture teachers never use this passage to prove their theory. If John's experience was a type of the rapture, why isn't Paul's experience a type of the same alleged rapture? These were supernatural experiences to individuals for the purpose of receiving divine revelations. And further in the Bible we read in Matthew chapter 24, by the way, a chapter that I very much would like to do an own broadcast with you on, Tom, because Matthew chapter 24 is so very, very <laughs> wrong deceived with most Christians that it would absolutely be interesting to do an own broadcast on Matthew 24 alone. But on Matthew 24 verses 36 through 42 we read, quote, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other one left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Unquote. Now the phrase, quote, the one shall be taken, and the other left, unquote, has been widely used to mean that the saints are taken in the rapture, and the wicked are left behind to endure the horrors of the tribulation. When any, any elementary Bible student reads the text concerning the days of Noah in verses 37 through 39, it is evident which ones are taken. It is not the righteous ones. Noah and his family that were taken away in the flood. For sure Jesus Christ is coming again. When he returns, it is not the righteous that he is going to remove, but the wicked. Our Lord's lesson of the removal of the wicked first is very evident in the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13 verses 24 through 30 and 63 through 43, 36 through 43. Jesus said that during the harvest at the end of the age the angels shall first gather the tares out of his kingdom and burn them. Then the righteous shall shine forth in the kingdom of their father. Paul the Apostle wrote to the Thessalonian saints and, uh, and set the record straight, as we can read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. Quote, and to you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance of them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. 
And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 we read, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Unquote. I once asked a professor of dispensational futurism for proof of the pre-trip rapture theory. The professor was a genuine born-again believer, highly educated with more than one doctorate, uh, with one doctorate degree and very qualified in his field of study. He was setting forth the party line for the pre-tribulation rapture. My question was, quote, Doctor, what concrete, what concrete biblical evidence is there for believing that the Christians will be raptured away before the tribulation to avoid the wrath of God that is poured out during that time? Unquote. With a, puzzled look, uh, with a puzzled look on his face and contemplating a minute concerning his answer, he said, The only real evidence I can think of is, God hath not appointed us to wrath. Ever since that day, I have wondered how does that apply to the thousands of first century saints who became martyrs and to whom that admonition was written. How does that fit with the 60 million Christians martyred under the heavy hand of Papal Rome during the Inquisition, the multiplied thousands of saints who were murdered under the dictates of Stalin, under the untold number of believers who died without mercy during communist takeover of China in 1948? Several years ago, an interview with Corrie ten Boom, who we actually quoted a little bit earlier, was recorded where she stated that during World War II, when Northern Europe was being overrun by invading military forces and Christians brutalized, many Christians ran to their pastors and asked them, Where is the rapture? And the pastors had no answer, and the saints had been living with a false hope. When these facts are pointed out to a rapturous teacher, their immediate rebuttal is, well, that means Christians sometimes suffer the wrath of man, but not the wrath of God, and the tribulation is God's wrath and not man's. Yet these same rapture teachers tell us that during the tribulation the Antichrist will have complete control and kill those who, quote, have the testimony of Jesus Christ, unquote. What about the souls under the altar crying for vengeance in Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11? What about the saints, quote, which came out of the uh, great tribulation, unquote, in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17? Surely they endured the wrath of man during the time when the pre-tribulation rapturists declare that this will be a time of the wrath of God. Under close scrutiny of logic and the searchlight of the scriptures, the pre-tribulation rapture theory and all its props simply are washed away like a sand castle during high tide. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Quote, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then... We, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Unquote. Now there's another part of the Bible where Jesus said, when they tell you, here's Christ or there, don't believe it. There he is in the desert, don't believe it. I remember Tom making the points in different of his broadcasts uh, earlier, whether together with me or his own readings on Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, when he said, 
When anybody says, well, here's Christ or there, the only thing you have to do is pinch yourself. When you're still in the flesh and you feel that you pinch yourself, you are probably still here. And Christ probably has not yet come. Are there any remarks you want to make, Tom, up to this? Yes, I'm simply going to reiterate what the author has been trying to tell the listener. There is no such thing as the rapture. There is no pre-trib, post-trib, or mid-trib rapture. There's only the resurrection at the last trump. And what we've been given from the pulpits of the churches, whether they be Roman Catholic or quote-unquote Protestant or quote-unquote evangelical, is the Catholic message. It's either preterism or futurism. And both are the way that the papacy has exonerated itself from the historical and biblical and prophetic identification as the Antichrist, the man of sin, the very one who throughout the ages, throughout the last 2,000 years, has persecuted and killed and tortured the saints of Almighty God. There was no rapture for them, and there'll be no rapture for us. Only the resurrection when Christ comes in fiery judgment. And when he comes in fiery judgment, he will remove the wicked and the meek shall inherit the earth. It's only then when God's vengeance serves those who have fallen as martyrs at the hands of the papacy and at the hands of the kings of the earth who serve him. You mentioned earlier in the reading that this futurist interpretation contradicts what is taught in the rapture, or rather the, the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy. Yeah, because John wrote this on the island of Patmos exactly. in 95 AD, and speaking about uh, things which must be hereafter. Yeah, and, and, and futurism and preterism are both creations of the Jesuits, and they contradict one another. Their house is divided, is it not? And a house divided unto itself cannot stand. That's the assurance that we have. And that, sh that house is going to be destroyed. Roman Catholicism, it's preterism, it's futurism, it's entire system of works, salvation, through auricular confession, through sacrifices of the mass, through indulgences, through the, the uh, uh Prayer to the dead saints, all of which is forbidden in the Scripture, is finally going to be destroyed. And until Christ comes, that monstrosity, Roman Catholicism, is going to continue to deceive the whole world and persecute the saints of Almighty God. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the little horn, the destroyer. He's Satan's vicar on the earth. He's not Christ's vicar. And all these false hopes that have been given to the Protestant churches were the false hopes that were given to Roman Catholics long ago in the Roman Catholic Church. The preterist teaching, the futurist teaching were, were alternative interpretations of Bible prophecy that exonerated the papacy and silenced dissent within the Roman Catholic Church of those who insisted after reading the scripture for themselves that the papacy was the Antichrist. And uh, what we're seeing now is, is the full belief system in either preterism or futurism, contradictory though they are, being bel the belief systems of all the so-called Christian churches, and neither one is correct. Historicism is the correct school of interpretation of Bible prophecy. And when we see two theories of uh, two schools or two systems of, of Bible prophecy interpretation, that being preterism and futurism, contradicting themselves, contradicting each other, then we're certain that both are lies. And they're author, these, oh, both of these lies are authored by the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. 
You can pick either error you want so long as you believe in error. So long as you're deceived, Rome doesn't care which deception you choose to believe in. And uh, we can see clearly by the division, the contradiction that are within these two Jesuit schools of Bible prophecy interpretation, how their house is divided and how they will be caught in their own folly. Yeah, that's also, and, Tom, why it is possible right. for the Roman Catholic Church to start or, 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 or found a one world religion. That's right. Because the only thing that all these quote unquote religions in the world today have in common is the lie, mm -hmm. the same lie. And that's what what they have in common. And that's why it is easy to make a, a, a world religion to uh, combine the Roman Catholics uh, with Islam, for example, because they both venerate the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe under another name, but it is the same person. It is the same goddess. It's the Queen of Heaven. And, uh, of course, the apostate Jews um, do the same. They did already in the time of Ezekiel, and they do in, in the time of today, as we know. And they have all that in common. So it doesn't matter what lie you believe, as long as you believe the lie, because then you have the same foundation. That's the right. lie. But mm -hmm. if you do not believe the lie, if you, belie if, if you believe the truth, the word of God, well, then you have a problem. Yeah. And then you cannot be part of... No, you cannot be part of the ecumenical movement. That's right. You cannot compromise the truth, because at the moment when you compromise the truth, it's... Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it's it's not the truth anymore. Yeah. Now let, let me bring was, another was, aspect. Yeah, just, I want just one thought that I want to get rid of here, Tom. I, I was listening to the archives in 2009. Uh, you're reading uh, All Roads Lead to Rome, doing interviews with Greg Szymanski or, or Greg Anthony for that matter at that time and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was one thing that you said that really caught my attention. Most Christians today, when you want to define a Christian today, what do they all have in common? Easter, Christmas, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. Not one of them are founded biblically. Okay. So when you take Easter, Christmas, and Sunday away, by what should be a Christian be defined? How can I define myself as a Christian when there is no Easter, no Christian, no Sunday, and uh, no Christmas, no Sunday? I found that a very good remark from you. And in, in, in 2009 already, we're speaking about eight years ago, yeah. people. Huh? That's right. That's that Tom right. came to that conclusion. Take away Easter, Christmas, and Sunday. Where's Christianity? Mm -hmm. I call it Christendom. Yeah. Those who are subjects of the Pope, they all have those things in common. You see, if true biblical Christianity would have been preserved by the saints instead of allowed to be apostatized by futurism and preterism and ecumenism, we would have virtually nothing in common with the Roman Catholic Church. We wouldn't have Christmas in common. We wouldn't have Easter in common. And we wouldn't have Sunday in common. And there wouldn't be any common ground on which to stand with the Roman Catholic Church. But because the Protestant reformers, when they left the Roman Catholic Church and when they protested Rome, they didn't protest enough. They didn't restore pristine biblical doctrine. And what we have left is now this, what is called the common ground, what we have in common with the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, we are one people. And we're not. Do you know that Luther once was asked why he didn't uh, pursue the, the Sabbath question? No, I, I was not aware of that. Go ahead. His answer was, and I don't quote verbatim, but it was in the sense of... Um, let's not introduce the Sabbath question because we have it already hard enough mm. to convince the people. Well, that pretty well sums it up, doesn't it? And that's one of the reasons why we made some years ago already that broadcast 
uh, in the uh, hour of the truth or nothing but the truth, why didn't the reformers go all the way? The Sabbath question. Yeah. That is the point, and I cannot bring that up more than enough. Whether you are now a Bible believer and a, a Sabbath follower or you're not a, Bi a, a Sabbath follower, I don't care. That's your conscience, and you have to make that up with your Lord. I made my conscience up with my Lord. Mm -hmm. But in that broadcast, it was very, very clear that in the 17th section, in the 17th session of the Council of Trent, which took place between 1545 and 1563, the Archbishop of Reggio called the Protestants out as rebels because they did not adhere to the word of God as they claimed sola scriptura when it came to the worship on the seventh Sabbath day that is only ordained in the Bible and for what there is no authority but the Church of Rome who transferred the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday mm -hmm. because they did not adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone as they claimed they were just seen as rebels. Yeah. And since then, treated as rebels. And, Tom, rightfully so, if they do not put their works where their mouth is. That's right. When they say sola scriptura, they should also live sola scriptura. If they don't, I'm sorry to hear, I'm, I'm sorry to say, and maybe you are offended, but I don't care. You are a hypocrite. That's right. And you are falling prey for every ecumenical movement the Roman Catholic Church puts out there because you're vulnerable, because you left the foundation that is Jesus Christ. That is his word, sola scriptura. That's right. And the Roman Catholic Church over and over and over made the point that there is no other authority but her and her tradition, which transferred the worship from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day of the week, Sunday. Mm -hmm. When you do not adhere to the word of God, where there is no proof in the whole Bible that God ever changed the day to be worshipped from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day of the week, Sunday, when you do not adhere to that teaching of God, then you are what the Roman Catholic Church calls you, a rebel within her ranks. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Tom, but I really had to get that off my chest. <laughs> well, there, there's not enough that could ever possibly be said about it. I mean, if sola scriptura was the byword of the Protestant Reformation, the Bible and the Bible alone is our authority. We reject the Pope and we reject the, the magisterium, we reject Roman Catholic canon law, we reject the whole Roman Catholic Church as synagogue of Satan, then why didn't they purge out all of the leaven of Rome? Why did they leave Sunday in their doctrine? Why did they maintain the pagan feast of what later was called uh, Christmas, what before was known as Saturnalia and celebrated in the pagan world? And likewise with Easter, the celebration of the ancient pagan Babylonian goddess Semiramis. Ishtar. Ishtar. Yeah, Easter is how you pronounce it, actually. It's yeah. spelled Ishtar, but it's pronounced Easter. That's right. And that is a point and that Alexander Hislop made in his book, yeah. And these, these, these pagan celebrations, as a matter of fact, and I haven't said this yet, but the first day of the week was venerated as the the, the the venerable day of the sun in the pagan world. And Rome adopted that under the name of Christianity. There's no sanction for, for a, a, a Sunday Sabbath anywhere in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we have record in the Bible, copious record in the Bible, that the Jews observed the correct biblical Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Jesus observed the biblical Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, and was even criticized by the religious leaders of Israel for, for picking corn on the Sabbath day, he and his disciples who were hungry. So there was no question about what day the Sabbath was then. And Paul preached to the Jews on one Sabbath and the Gentiles to the next Sabbath. Okay? What Sabbath was that? 
Well, it was the same one that Jesus observed, his father's Sabbath, the seventh day, was founded on the seventh day of the, of the creation. It has never changed. There's no scriptural justification at all. Rome even admits this. There's no scriptural justification for Sabbath at all. So when you for say Sunday, sola scriptura, Sunday, you have to believe, to, you have to adhere so, to that. And, and so the Roman Catholic Church's grievance against the Protestants was that they claimed sola scriptura, but they were hypocrites and maintained Roman Catholic tradition and Roman Catholic canon law. Roman Catholic canon law just stipulates the first day of the week be, re, be observed by all of Christendom as the Lord's Day. Well, it was never the Lord's Day. The papacy made it the Lord's Day, and it's not the Lord's Day even today. It's the ancient pagan uh, venerable day of the sun, and it was just simply baptized and called the new Sabbath in honor of Christ's resurrection on the early on the first day of the week. But that's not at all the Sabbath. There's absolutely no scriptural justification for it whatsoever. And Paul didn't acknowledge any first day of the week's Sabbath rest. He rested on the first day of the week, or rather he rested on the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week. The Jews rested on the, on the seventh day of the week. The Gentile Christians rested on the seventh day of the week. And this was Rome's bone of contention at the Council of Trent against the Protestants, who they eventually came to term as just simply rebels because they claimed the Bible out of one side of their mouth and they kept Roman Catholic pagan tradition, Christianized paganism, and they were, in Rome's view, hypocrites. Okay, Rome doesn't have a beef with those who observe the seventh day of the week who claim sola scriptura and observe the seventh day of the week. Rome doesn't have a bone of contention with them. Rome has more respect for true Sabbath keepers than they ever did the Protestants. Okay, Rome wouldn't pursue me as a heretic because I preach sola scriptura and I practice sola scriptura. I'm not a hypocrite by their standard of hypocrisy, but the Protestants are hypocrites. And that's Rome's contention. Now that Rome has simply stated that if you're going to be Protestant, then be fully Protestant. And if you're going to be Catholic, then be fully Catholic. But you can't have it both ways. Actually, if you're going to be a heretic, if you're going to be a heretic, then we are justified in killing you. Actually, Rome says, don't compromise. That's, the, that's exactly what Rome's saying. That was the message at the Council of Trent. And, and Martin Luther responded, as you say, by saying, haven't we got enough on our hands rather than taking on this Sunday issue? That's when they should have taken on the Sunday issue. They would have they would have they would have adjourned the Council of Trent and never declared war on Protestantism. They could have lived in peace, maybe. Look, it's the Protestant. As much as I hate to admit it, I call myself a Protestant, but I'm a full Protestant. Rome doesn't have a beef with me. Rome has to has a beef with the pretended Protestant churches, and that's why they've made a, a blood covenant to conquer those Protestant churches and bring them back to the Roman Catholic Church because they didn't stand their Protestant ground. Okay? You, you have to, at least in one aspect, you have to admire the Roman Catholic Church because they've admitted they don't have a problem with Protestants claiming the Scripture and the Scripture alone when they practice the Scripture and the Scripture alone. It's when they tried to leave a little Roman tradition, a little Roman Catholic canon law in their practice while claiming to be anti-Pope, well, while claiming that the Pope is the Antichrist. 
Well, but to okay. say that the, that Rome has no problem with the real Sabbath keepers, I wouldn't subscribe to that because you know that during the Inquisition, people like the Valdenses, the Albigenses, who were old Bible-believing folks, people who adhered to the Sabbath keeping, of course, were destroyed during the Inquisition and and and, and all the wars in that time. Well, I've never read anything anywhere that positively asserted that either one of those groups, the Albigensians or the Waldensians, didn't observe the Sunday Sabbath. This no, might be something I, else I, that we can research. I thought they were Sabbath keepers. They protested Rome. That much is a certainty. What day they venerated is still in question in my mind well, maybe from the research that I've done. Okay, maybe then we have to look into that. But to me, it is yeah. quite simple that because they were actually adhering to Sola Scriptura, they were preaching the Bible and bringing the word out from the Alps into the into the villages of the people and turning Catholics over to real Bible-believing Christians. I think they also kept the Sabbath, but I have to tell or I have to confirm as you that I have not studied it that, day, that far. I was just... Um, uh, I was just assuming that because they adhere to the Bible and that's why Rome persecuted them because Rome did not persecute them only because they thought Rome was the Antichrist um, but uh, because they also kept the Sabbath they really kept to the word of God that was not known at that time but I, I don't want to make a discussion point of that maybe we have to look a little bit deeper into that yeah. but I think it is quite sure to say that of course all the people who keep the Sabbath and keep the commandments of the Lord, uh, the people who the Bible calls the saints, are persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church for just doing that. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Tom, you have a point when you say that the Roman Catholic Church turns against this quote-unquote Protestants who try to mix the quote-unquote holy with the profane, <laughs> when we when we can teach the Roman Catholic dogma as holy and the profane as um, as the Bible, that's the way yeah. the Roman Catholic Church sees it anyway. Yeah, but when they try to make the compromise on the Sabbath point, you, you're absolutely right. But I think that history shows that true Bible-believing Christians have been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church all the way. And those were Sabbath keepers. So to say that Rome does not have a problem with Sabbath keepers, I don't think that's quite true. But on the other hand, those are easy to find, eh? <laughs> well, certainly, since the whole world observes Romans' Sabbath, the Roman Lord's Day, it's the first day of the week, then Rome expects everyone else to settle on that. But but they, the, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't have the grounds on the Sabbath issue to pursue with lethal uh, authority Sabbath keepers who uphold the word of God and are not hypocrites, as they claim the Protestants were, on, on the issue of Sabbath. But, but Rome has, has perverted the gospel. We, we've been talking about all the counterfeit Bibles yeah. uh, on Inquisition Update on a daily basis now for, for quite some time. And these new ecumenical Bibles, these new Jesuit Bibles, are, are going to bring the whole world to a veneration of the first day of the week. And they're even making inroads to make this a law in Israel today. Yeah, it started already, right? That, yes. Uh, that mm -hmm. in uh, in uh, Tel Aviv, uh, between Friday night and Saturday night, now it is legal for shops to open. Yeah. Meaning they break the seventh day Sabbath. That's right. And there are reports I know from so-called Seventh-day Adventist congregations in New York and other places in the United States of America that not only they are also venerating Sunday now, but they also invite Roman Catholic priests uh, to speak from their pulpits. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this That's is right. all, all a result of the ecumenical movement, which of course brings us to the book that you are reading for the moment on First Amendment Radio in, uh, in your show, or in your broadcast, sorry, I don't want to call it a show, it's not a show. 
No, it's but not on a your... show. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> looking for the right word. But to call Inquisition Update a show, that is absolutely blasphemy. <laughs> no, it is, a, it, is a, it is a wonderful Christian broadcast where you are reading right. and discussing the book uh, from Michael the Semlian, uh, The Foundations Under Attack, that deals, of course, a lot with the uh, forged Bibles. And I think here and there gives you an idea to probably also have a look at uh, Gail Ripplinger's book, the New Age Bible Versions, which you probably had here and there, uh, to confirm a few of the uh, viewpoints of um, Michael de Semlian in that book, right? That's right. That's right. The, be the, the best authority that I know of in the world today to show side-by-side -side comparisons of the, of the King James Version and all the counterfeit Bibles is Gail Ripplinger's book, New Age Bible Versions. New Age Bible Versions. I, re I highly recommend that book. So you can see side by side. And, the, and these counterfeit Bibles have left whole verses. They've left whole segments of the Bible completely out. Not only have they done that, they've changed the wording of the Bible so that it can't uh, interpret itself, and uh, uh, th which is unique of the King James Bible, it's unique only to the King James Bible. The King James Bible can interpret itself. Okay? The rest of the Bibles are bereft of that ability. Mm. And that's what identifies them as counterfeit Bibles. Now, I'd like to make a point that I, that I started to make earlier. You've heard me say over and over again that preterism and futurism were anciently taught in the Roman Catholic Church to silence dissent within the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Those who came to accuse, those within the Roman Catholic Church who, reading the Scriptures, came to the conclusion that the papacy was the man of sin, were given alternative interpretations of Bible prophecy NIV. that would exonerate the papacy of that, of that charge from Roman Catholics. That was preterism and futurism. They, the Roman Catholic Church historically taught some version of preterism, that the prophecies were all fulfilled before the fall of the Roman Empire, or futurism, that the man of sin, the son of perdition, won't appear in the world until some seven years before Christ's literal return. This exonerates the papacy of any charge of being the Antichrist of the Bible. That silenced dissent within the Roman Catholic Church. Anybody who held to the, to, the, to the idea that the papacy was the Antichrist, the Inquisition was set up to purge out those people within the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? Now, preterism and futurism were both introduced into the Protestant seminaries. If it, look, if it silenced dissent within the Roman Catholic Church, it would be the secret weapon against the Protestant Reformation if they would buy it, if they would believe it. So they brought the preterist and futurist interpretations of Bible prophecy into the seminaries of the Protestant churches, the Protestant seminaries, colleges, and universities. And that's where they that's where they got it in the in the early 19th century in the in the in the early 1800s, and since now it has become the orthodox teaching, whether preterism or futurism, in the Protestant churches. No more do they teach historicism. That's what was taught by all Christians, all true Bible believing Christians throughout the centuries. Okay, historicism has been. Uh, relegated to the ash bin of history since the early 1800s. Okay, now what Rome intends to do is to show the inconsistencies and therefore the illegitimacy of Protestantism because Protestants don't even agree between themselves. Some of them are preterist and say the Bible prophecies are all fulfilled before the fall of the Roman Empire. And some of them believe in a futurism. So see, it cannot be the body of Christ. It cannot be the truth because their house is divided. Well, who divided it? Rome did. She used the same strategy in the Protestant churches that she used in the Roman Catholic Church to stifle the accusation that the papacy is the Antichrist. And now those ancient teachings in the Roman Catholic Church are going to be the very things that Rome uses 
to show the hypocrisy, the contradiction of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Because it's been so successfully infiltrated into the Protestant mind and preached from the Protestant churches, er, Protestant pulpits ever since the 1800s. But trust me, in the Protestant world, futurism and preterism are both condemned by the early Protestant reformers. They were condemned. And we've named those authors, we've named those Protestant reformers that condemn preterism and condemn futurism. And this book that we're reading is just one of the many who preceded it centuries ago. Hmm. And uh, so, so what has, what had long ago silenced dissent within the Roman Catholic Church has now become the orthodox teaching of the once Protestant churches. And Rome's literally going to use that to say that Protestantism is a failed experiment because they can't even agree amongst themselves. You want agreement in the Protestant church? Return to historicism. Then Rome knows her lies have not been believed. And that's the only hope for the Protestant churches. Up until that time, Rome will regard, will regard Protestants as nothing but self-contradicting rebels who disrupted and destroyed the old world order with their phony Protestant Reformation. And the only thing they deserve is to be conquered and brought back into the Roman Catholic Church, kicking and screaming, and to mount up in their in their nations, in their militaries, to help conquer the whole world for the papacy. That's what the United States is doing today. All the wars we fight are to secure the rest of the recalcitrant nations of this world to submit to the new world order. Listen, Syria and, and, and North Korea know that this new world order is going to destroy their sovereignty their national sovereignties. Now, whether whether you disagree with, with North Korean politics or not, what matters to them is that they maintain their individuality. They maintain their national sovereignty and that they not be absorbed into this new world order. They know there's something really, really wrong with this new world order, as ignorant as they are, as, 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 as uh, you know, spiritually blind as they are. They're smarter than the Protestants. <laughs> they don't want to be a part. That's right. They don't want to be a part of this new world order. L listen, uh, you know, uh, Libya didn't want to be a part of this new world order. No. Gaddafi had something. his own plans. He had his absolutely. own plans. He wanted absolutely. to green the desert. That's right. That's right. He wanted to take care of his people. Oh, okay? he did. Did you and know that I'm... when you were married in, in, in Libya, you got a house and, and you got free health care and all that stuff? And I understand they still had a gold, a gold standard for their currency. Yeah. yeah. That will not suffice in the Pope's New World Order. The Pope owns all the gold in we the New World Order. We are already giving order. fake money, Tom. That's right. We're just giving Monopoly money. It has no more value than the Monopoly money that we played with when we were kids. It has no value whatsoever unless you consider its value is debt, which it is. Literally, when you walk into the store to buy a loaf of bread, you take real goods and services at the store that has intrinsic value, and you hand them in return debt. Every, every Federal Reserve note is called a note because it's a loan. How nice it would be if I could walk into a, 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 a store someplace and hand, take real goods and services and hand them part of my debt. That's exactly what I do every time I go into the store. Every, the laws of this land make every one of us thieves, worse than thieves. And that's Rome's destiny for all of us. Yeah. I don't know about you guys over there in America, but we here in Europe have had... Uh, for some years now, I, I think it fell almost to sleep, but we have had a, a movement that was called the barter system. Yeah. And um, that they were really uh, exchanging goods with goods. 
You yeah. know, you give me so much of this and I give you so much of that. They were bartering. And that's a lawful system, of course. Yes, to and, of, and of course, they also developed their own currency within that bartering system so that you don't have, always have to exchange actually the goods, but then exchange the quote unquote barter money. Uh, and I have a client, you know, I sell wines. I have a client who has a restaurant who I wanted to make an appointment with a few weeks ago to sell wines again. And she said to me, well, come back to the end of the year because I saved a lot of this barter uh, points and I'm just buying my wines with that barter system at the moment. You understand that I can't can do business with you and with the barter system at the same time. I said, if anybody in the world understands, I think it's me. <laughs> yeah. You certainly would understand. Yeah, yes. I understood. I didn't tell her why, but uh, of course, I understood absolutely, and I like this. And th this barter system, well, that's w w what you just say, Tom, when you go into uh, a bakery store and the baker stands there and in his own sweat bakes, uh, uh, needs, the, uh, needs the dough and bakes the bread, and then you go in there and you pay him uh, when you think money and you only give him debt. That's if right. He, if he knew that, he would never give you the bread. That's right. That's exactly right. Our whole system is built on theft. And why is that? Because Jesus paid it all. That's right, because the Pope is is in control. The Pope has created this system of debt. It's the Roman system that we follow. That's what this book condemns. Yep. This book that we're reading is in condemnation of the Roman system. In a true Protestant system, there would be no such thing. But the Protestant system has failed because it mixed the holy with the profane. The Protestant reformers were struck by a move of God, by the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit and the written word of God. But they stopped short. That's why the Protestants are now reuniting with the Roman Catholic Church. They wanted to go for a marathon and they stepped after the first mile. Yeah. They didn't finish the race. Paul finished the race. The Protestants didn't. Now, I call myself a Protestant, but not in that sense. I'm a biblical Protestant. I've gone the last mile. I've kicked out Roman tradition. All of it. Rome doesn't have a beef with me, other than she has converted the whole rest of the world to her Roman system and I'm and m myself and of what few there are in the world like me are in such a, a minority that we don't even count. And we're going to be forced to follow the rest of the uh, the rest of the idolaters. Look, your God is not determined by the one you profess with your mouth. Your your God is determined by the one you obey, and the whole world obeys the papacy. Knowingly or unknowingly? Unknowingly and unknowingly. Wittingly and unwittingly. Yes, that's correct. Because many people, when I speak to them and I tell them they are Roman Catholic, they laugh at me and say, no, I'm not religious. <laughs> 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 I say, no, but the Roman Catholic Church is not a spiritual, it is a temporal that's power. That's right. Temporal power. And people who don't get that will never understand that they are made Catholic through the civil law. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't help it, Tom. We always come back to this little video, this wonderful video from Richard Bennett that I have uploaded on my second channel. Everyone can watch yes. it there and everywhere else. If you just type in in, uh, in Google search or in a YouTube search, Vatican control through civil law. You will be led to a video by a wonderful, wonderful brother in Christ, Richard Bennett, who was more than 20 years a deceived Roman Catholic priest, came out of it and since then had made it his ministry to teach the people the biblical truth. And he tells you in that almost an hour long video how 
everybody of us, willingly or unwillingly, wittingly or unwittingly, is made Roman Catholic by obeying the civil law of the beast that we are living in. That's right. Bible plainly tells us the the man of sin, the beast, it the, rules over the kings of the earth. And therefore, if the rules over the kings of the earth, if the papacy rules over the kings of the earth, then the laws of the kings of the earth must conform to Roman Catholic canon law. And you'll look, and, and after investigation, you'll find out that they do. Even Martin Luther made that point already in his 1520 dissertation uh, in the letter to the German nobility when he at the first uh, attacking the first wall that the papists built around them for protection and he attacked that first wall they said that the spiritual power is above the temporal that's right and that's also shown in the vatican flag where the golden key of the spiritual power is over the silver key which represents the temporal power yeah but most people tom i mean People like us who have studied that for quite a while now. I mean, I'm relatively new in this, but you have been studying that for more than a decade now. And we know that the Roman Catholic quote-unquote church is actually a political power that baptized itself with the spirituality of quote-unquote Christendom. Yeah. So that they could act under the camouflage let's say i don't have a better word for that right now under the camouflage of christendom they could act to enact the civil power over all the people that's right when the people for once go to revelation 17 and understand that verse the woman that rides the beast the church that rides a kingdom this That's is right. the smallest kingdom people in the whole world, 108 acres, the That's Vatican. Right. The Vatican is a state. A state is a beast. Mm -hmm. And the Roman Catholic Church rides that beast. That's right. And that beast has control over all the kings of the earth. Close your eyes. Picture it for yourself. The little horn takes the power. Out of the ten horns of the Roman Catholic, of the Roman pagan empire arose a little horn. It is the smallest of them all that takes all the power. That's the right. The Vatican, the smallest state in the world, has all the power. The Vatican, who claims that it's so poor and has no money, has all the money. The That's Roman right. Catholic Church, who says she has no power at all, has actually all the power but only because we give it to them. That's right. It's voluntary. There's no protest anymore. And that's how the beast, the governments of the world, carry the Roman Catholic Church and do her bidding in the world. Revelation chapter 17 is just a pictorial description of the Roman Catholic Pope ruling over the kings of the earth. Okay, decked in scarlet and purple, the color of his bishops and his cardinals, with a golden cup in her hand, that is the golden cup of the mass, and Eucharist. all the riches of the world. Read Revelation chapter 18. The chapter division between 17 and 18 are man-made. Revelation chapter 17 and 18 are one continuous description of the Roman Catholic Church state. The woman and the beast, the church and the state. It's a global system, and it controls all of the economies of the world. It controls all the civil laws of the world. And the beast, the governments of the world, carry her wherever she wishes to go. Yeah, with the commerce, Tom, a very important point when you go to Revelation 18, verse Absolutely. 23, verse 23, and I quote, uh, the latter part of the uh, of the verse, not the whole verse. It reads, "For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, 
for by sure. thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Yeah. Now, who holds the power for all the merchants in this world? All the merchants, meaning all the big companies. And yeah. now think back before we had quote-unquote globalism, which today develops more and more and more, the usurping of the big companies, taking out the small companies, eradicating totally the middle class, which was, of course, not there in the Dark Ages and was, which will not be there in the new coming Dark Ages of the New World Order. All the companies, the mega companies of this world are owned by people who are whether engaged in Freemasonry or are engaged in papal knighthoods as That's the right. Knight of Malta, the Knights of Columbus and their deriv derivatives. This yep. means for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for the, by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. That's right. Those are the men. Those are the ones who trade um, with all the goods in the world and even right. with the souls of men. That's right. Now notice that every product you buy in the system of commerce in the world has on its packaging or on the, the item itself, a universal product code. And what do we know about the word universal? It means Catholic. Catholic and universal are interchangeable words. They're just spelled differently. A universal product code simply identifies all the goods of the earth as being under control of the Catholic Church. And that's how you link that to the merchants of the earth that you just discussed are the major corporations of the world are owned ultimately by cooperative third parties subservient to the papacy. Otherwise, they would not allow these universal product codes to be stamped on their on their on their goods. And there's another point, Tom. Um, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas from uh, Presence of God Ministry, who you know is uh, from uh, the uh, remnant of uh, Seventh-day yeah. Adventist Church things, there, has a wonderful yeah. website. He made a video a short time ago about how all these big companies, and I just name now Coca-Cola and, and whatever, you know, all these big sure. companies, have a look at them, Walt Disney and ever, how they put in their logo, hidden, not in plain sight, but you can see it when you have eyes to see and ears to hear, as the Bible says, they hide in there the 666. Yeah. Which means that and they are, with their logo, giving official adherence to that they belong to the man of sin. That's right. With all the logos. You, you should watch that That's video right. up. I mean, not only you, Tom. I mean, every watcher of this video. Look it up. Presence of God Ministries. The website. I can tell you when you start digging in that website and you want to do research, you need two lives or three lives just to get through that website. What that guy yeah. all, always carried together, it's incredible. Yeah. And this one video is absolutely worth watching. You will see in all these different logos the number 666. And that's why I mentioned they are whether part of Roman Catholic uh, papal knight orders or of Freemasonry, because ultimately Freemasonry is only the Protestant arm of the Jesuit order. And right. all the papal knight orders are on the top as Freemasonry controlled by one man. The same man that Napoleon said, the volition of one man who controls it all, called the Black Pope, the General of the Society of Jesus, which actually yeah. is, of course, no wonder, the Society of mm -hmm. Satan. Now, let me ask you a question, Yerk. We've, we've just spent nearly an hour talking about these things most people have never heard of before. But, but who do you suppose is the Antichrist? Is it somebody in the future or is it somebody in the here and now? Is it somebody that has existed all throughout the Christian era? 
I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this question in a way that you probably makes you laugh. Long before I ever was believing in the God of the Bible, I watched a movie um, that was called The Omen. I don't know if you know that one. It's from the 1970s, no. from the early 1970s. No. It has, uh, among others, as actor Gregory Peck, I think, in there. And it deals with the Antichrist. It's a little child that is very demonish, very demonic, uh, kills uh, his, his, his um, uh, how do you call that, um, uh, uh, the woman who, who, who looks over that, his, uh, his babysitter or something, mm -hmm. yeah, his, 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 his maid, his, his whatever, um, uh, does a lot of bad things and was associated with the Antichrist. I mean, it's more than 20 years ago or even 30 years ago that I watched these movies, and uh, there are three, I think, uh, Omen 1, 2, and 3. And I didn't believe in God because, well, of numerous reasons that I explained in other videos, I don't go here now that far, but the point was that made me shiver. Wow. All of a sudden, I was afraid of the Antichrist. I didn't even know who Christ was. <laughs> 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 but, but seeing that... I was afraid of the Antichrist. Who yeah. is it? Was my question. Yeah. yeah. And now, it's... through the study of the Bible and God finding me and tipping me on the shoulders in some time ago, I finally know the answer. And the yeah. answer, and you can watch as many movies as you want. You will never find the answer. The answer where the Bible, uh, where, where, where the answer where the Antichrist is to be found is in the Bible and only sure. in the Bible. And when you yep. go out there and believe any man interpreting the Bible for you, you are following yep. a man and not Jesus Christ. And right. don't be surprised then when you be when you be led to the ditch. Yep. Yep. We've all been led astray. Yeah. From cradle to grave. If yep. not at a certain moment, God tips us on the shoulder and says, Hey, stop right here. I'm going to show you something. And when you've read that, you can make your own decision. And once you've tasted the truth, you never want to go back. That's right. But listen, to go back, because you made a very valuable point, we are almost an hour busy about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make one point. I want to go back to the, um, to the Forged Bibles. Uh, which we spoke a little bit about. And of course, that uh, is, is, is right into your uh, ministry um, Inquisition update and your teaching and reading that you do right now on Inquisition update with the book Foundations Under Attack from Michael Desemlian. Um, I am subbed to a YouTube channel that I uh, only partially advise because like most YouTube channels that I can advise, it has its faults, it has its flaws. But there are a lot of videos uploaded in there that are very interesting. And for the moment, every day I receive one or two, at least, short videos, about three to five minutes long. And um, they are exposing, most of the times, the NIV in comparison to the King James Bible. Oh, yeah. So today I uh, received a video of three minutes twenty long from the video channel is called Dave Flang, D A V E and new word F L A N G Dave Flang, and that video is called NIV strips your king of his kingdom, and he reads believe it or not from the Lord's Prayer in the King James Version Matthew chapter six verse thirteen quote and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. That's what the King James reads. Now listen to right. what the NIV reads. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Delete, 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 delete. Yeah, that's right. So that means... For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen is not quoted in the NIV. By the way, that's the same as the Douai Rames, the Jesuit yep. Bible. Yep. 14 important words that identify the owner of the kingdom are in the King James and not to be found in the NIV. So the NIV says sure. nothing about who owns the kingdom. 
That's right. So it can be very easily, Tom, that that kingdom belongs to the Pope, right? That's right. The man of sin. That's right. That's the purpose of all these counterfeit Bibles. You've given us only one example. <laughs> But they're all just as diabolical in their content. Yeah. In the description box of that video, there are many, many links. Uh, I'm just scrolling down here. Yeah? It's like answers to your Bible version questions. The uh, TNIV, does character matter in translators? Why another Spanish Bible? What happens when by is changed to with by Spanish translators? The heresies of Westcott and Hort. Uh, and, and so on and so on and so on. There are at least, and I do not exaggerate now, there are at least 20 to 25 links in the description box of this video alone. When you watch this little 3 minute 20 videos and then you click on a few of these other uh, links, which are not all videos, but often lead you to websites that you can read and study for, among others, um, Chick Publications is one of them, among them. Um, then you have a lot of work to do. So whenever you are daring to comment beneath this video, Jörg, Tom, why are you proposing the King James? The King James version has its faults. I dare you, go to Dave Flang, look at these videos, study all these links, and then you know why Tom and I say from the bottom of our heart the King James and the King James only is the only true Bible. And think about it. Right. It's not about which is the oldest Bible, but in this case, it is the case because the King James was first and all the other derivatives came later because they were That's forged right. by the <coughs> Jesuits. That's right. That's right. <coughs> okay, shall I continue reading in the book? Yes. I still have a few pages to go, Tom. <laughs> 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 On the bottom of page 54, I continue. From this, we just read, as you probably maybe remember still, we read, we just read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. From this and other scriptural passages, it is evident the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming again. When he descends, he comes to remain on the earth and remove out of his kingdom that which offends and works iniquity, as we can read in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. The angel Gabriel told Mary that her son Jesus shall be given the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, as we can read in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. This definitely sounds like he will be reigning here on the earth forever. Even Jesus taught his disciples to pray, quote, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven, as we can read in Matthew 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. How fitting that I just quoted from what the NIV left out in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, That's right? right? This That's is right. the Holy Spirit working and putting it all together, Tom. So, and just at this moment, the Skype connection between Tom and me broke down. And uh, when I called him back, he was too exhausted to continue the broadcast. So this is where I leave you with the reading and discussing of the book, uh, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism for today, the tense part. And we will continue next time in part 11 on the bottom of page 54 and repeat the last paragraph that's been there. I hope that it shook some people up out of their dream that they are in, that they finally grasp what it is really all about, what the Roman Catholic Church is really all about and how deep the deception really goes. So, because Tom cannot say goodbye, I will say goodbye for him. Uh, blessings and the one who uh, seized the sacrifices and oblations 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, in Daniel chapter 9. And you can reach Tom for comments and for emails on tom at seawaves.us, tom at seawaves.us, as the waves of the sea. And me, of course, you can reach via 
the comment section of the video or send a personal message via YouTube or address me at Skype, Jogler77, as most of the people know. But always write a motivation to the contact request who you are and where you know me from, otherwise I will not engage. Too many spam contacts on Skype otherwise. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening to the video. Until next time, Jogger 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you and bye bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know there is heaven also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.